look right. It's a fault lead interpretation, ACS management, really very high level though, because I, as I was putting this together, it is the king of all rabbit holes when it comes to um, all of the information that you could potentially learn. And as you start picking through things, there's all of these differing scenarios in which it could become worse or different or better. And so um, this is just a really basic overview. There are some really good books. So I think it's Dale Dubin puts out a really good one. It's like an orange yeah. EKG book. Um, and that one's fantastic to go through to kind of start doing some of the um, rhythm interpretation pieces. But this is, it's definitely a challenging topic. Um, and I think yeah. on the paramedic side, I'm, I feel like your schooling's a little bit better with this. Well, actually a lot better with this because at least you talk about it. I know on the nursing side, we didn't do 12 leads at all. And even when I worked, yeah, I've heard um, about it. there's nothing, there's nothing. It's just, you don't need to know. So you just weird. do the EKG and you pass it off to the provider and, and let them do their thing. So it's, bizarre. Um, it's it always been a very challenging topic for me. So I had to do like a ton of research and I pulled Justin in on quite a few pieces to make sure that everything looked okay. Um, Cause it, it is, it's, it's challenging. Um, but just to go through, so a quick anatomy review, so the electrical system. So heart generates an active potential, right? Causing the muscle to contract. And um, that electrical activity is always going to happen before you have mechanical activity. And so just kind of going through the system, we've got our, um, typically our electrical activity starts in that SA node. So it's that node right up here in the right atrium. Um, and then that moves down the right atrium to the left atrium and travels to the AV node, which is that group of cells located in the bottom of the right atrium, just behind the tricuspid valve. And then that impulse is gonna continue to travel down through the bundle of Hiss, which is in that upper portion of the interventricular septum. And then it's gonna move down those bundle branches, um, spreading down the right and the left bundle. And then it gets to the ventricles and it causes that contraction. And so that movement of electricity is what you see with your P, Q, R, S, and T wave, right? Um, that's kind of what you can see here on the end, your P wave, and then your Q, R, S is moving through and the T wave is that recovery or relaxation. All right, when it comes to the actual waveform itself, um, these pieces are, are Important to understand, especially as we start looking through some of the segments, but that Q wave. So that's the first negative deflection before the R wave, and that represents your initial depolarization of the interventricular septum. And then we've got um, our R wave is the first positive, typically, deflection. It represents depolarization of that main portion of the ventricles. Um, and then we've got our S wave is the third piece, which is the negative deflection right at the end here following the R wave, and that represents the final depolarization of the ventricles. So it's all kind of all three pieces of how that moves through the ventricles. And then the other point that I wanted to point out that doesn't always get talked about very much, and I know I was not super familiar with um, for a long time, is the J point. So the J point is the junction between the end of the QRS and the beginning of that ST segment. So it's kind of, it's the end of the depolarization phase and the beginning of the repolarization phase. And so what we'll see when we look at like a bunch of slides later, um, there's gonna be talk of like J point slurring. Um, and what that essentially is, is having an issue moving from your depolarization to your repolarization. The J point is an important piece to understand that we'll talk about more later. So just keep that in mind, it's right between the QRS and the ST segment. All right, so the vessels themselves, um, so we've got our coronary arteries, that's what we're mostly worried about when we talk about MIs, right? And they have multiple branches and that are supplying oxygenated blood to the heart and then the cardiac veins are helping to remove the oxygen depleted blood, so just like any other system in the body, right? But the issue arises when the heart demands more oxygen than the system is able to supply and that's when we start seeing the different types of coronary syndromes that we'll talk about later. So your aorta branches off into um, two main coronary arteries. So you've got your right and your left. And these are located just behind the cusps of the aortic semilunar valve. Um, and they supply the heart blood during diastole, so during that relaxation. Um, and, and so it's kind of a, a, a passive movement of blood actually um, during that relaxation phase from the aorta and it just kind of comes underneath those leaflets. And then the vessels, I mean, they're kind of important to understand what vessels they are and roughly where they are, because as we start looking at the 12 lead and we're starting to see abnormalities, we can identify um, for the most part what vessel we think might, might be involved, which is important. So you can see here, you've got your right coronary 
coronary artery. It's originating on the side of the aorta. Um, it comes off. You've got your right marginal that'll branch off of that, kind of moving in this downward loop. Said, and that supplies blood flow typically to your right atrium and your right. All right, and then you can see that you've got some posterior involvement as well. RCA curves around, and then you have that posterior descending artery. And then we have our left coronary. That's kind of the one that everybody likes to talk about and that we hear a little bit more about because um, it, it's that big, massive one that's giving most of the blood flow to the left ventricle, which is that powerhouse. So that uh, left coronary artery, so your LCA originates off the left side of the area of the aorta and makes up the left main coronary artery. And then that splits into your left anterior descending and your left circumflex. So the left anterior descending travels to the front of the heart along that interventricular sulcus, so right along the middle here, and supplies blood flow to both the um, anterior surfaces of both ventricles, so the front sides of both the right and the left. And then branches of the LED further divide into diagonal and septal arteries. So there's a lot of smaller arteries in here that very cardiologists can name very quickly for trivia night, but I unfortunately do not know as well. Um, <laughs> and then you have the left circumflex artery. So that encircles the heart muscle moving around to the posterior. And that's going to give more blood flow to that left atrium and parts of the left ventricle. And then that is going to further divide as well. You can see there's a lot of pieces. Big ones to really keep in mind are that RCA, your right marginal, and your left coronary, which branches off into the two main left circ, and your left anterior descending. Those are kind of the big ones that we want to keep in mind. So this chart, um, it really just kind of tries to impress upon the importance of which arteries are affecting which parts of the muscle and which parts of the conduct conduction system. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the specifics, but as you look through this, and you can even pause it if you're watching it later and kind of read through, every person is a little different. So while, let's see, oh, about 90% of patients get their um, blood supply for their AV node from their RCA, but that's only 90%, so 10% don't. So there's a lot of different variation um, around the blood vessels and what they're supplying. And so uh, while you can look on an EKG and think that you're finding um, part of the right ventricle might be involved in that patient, it might not be. So it was kind of an interesting thing to review um, because again, it, depending on what portions of your heart is being affected in your 12 lead is going to depend on your overall status, the hemodynamic status. Um, and so it really just helps to have an idea as to what vessels are controlling what pieces so that you can know what you're gonna look for later. So. Now let's talk about actually doing the 12 lead itself. So there are limb leads, right? So we've got a couple of different limb leads. Um, so as we put them on, we only actually put on four limb leads, the, the top and the right arm, right leg, um, right arm, left arm, and then right leg, left leg. But those actually make up these bipolar leads. So they, they all kind of combine to be able to see images of the heart in a different way. So leads uh, one, two, and three make up the standard bipolar limb leads. And a bipolar lead essentially just means that it's registering voltage between two leads. And so they're looking at the heart on a frontal plane. So the three electrodes placed on the limbs are going to form that equilateral triangle that we refer to as Einhoven's triangle. Um, and there's a lot of cool videos on that too, because that was something I didn't fully understand at first. And then watching it later, it, it just made so much more sense. Um, but you can see these yellow areas are what the bipolar leads are viewing. And so um, you can see here that, you know, the right arm and the left arm, they're essentially coming together in the middle and then looking down at the heart. And same with the left leg and the right arm, they come together and look at it from the side. And so um, they're able to look at it from three different angles and then leads AVR, AVL, and AVF are your augmented voltage limb leads. So these ones are actually unipolar, meaning that they're only looking in the one direction. And so you can see these purple leads, that's what it's looking at from below your left leg, it's looking directly up your right arm, it's looking into the right area of the heart, left arm to the left side. And so with just those three leads, you actually get six different images, which is pretty cool. Then we have our precordial leads. So these are also unipolar and look at the heart on the horizontal plane instead of the frontal plane. And so we refer to these as the V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. 
We really want to make sure that we correctly apply these though, because they're doing a direct view of specific portions of the heart. So if you think of it as a camera taking a picture, it's only going to take a picture of directly what you pointed at. And that's exactly what these precordial leads are. The limb leads, you can pretty much put them anywhere and they're going to work themselves out. Um, but not these, these really need to be in the right place. And so we want to make sure that we're putting them um, like our V1, you can see here on the image, you've got that fourth intercostal space to the right side of the sternum. Um, V2 is on the left side. And then as you as you move through, making sure that you put them in the correct intercostal space. So then that way, when we do an EKG later and we look and it's looking at that exact same camera angle, we can see if there's truly been a change in the patient's heart or has it just been a change of the EKG technician, which is can account for some variation between EKGs. So it, it's really important to put these on correctly. I don't think we always do a good job, myself included, because you've got um, really hectic situations. You've got larger patients where it's really hard to actually feel the, feel the intercostals to get where you need to go. Um, if you have a woman with larger breasts, it can be really hard to get the proper placement for V2, V3, V4, V5. So um, there are definitely some difficulties here, but that's the goal is, is that we put them in the same place every time. And then there's a couple of different types of EKGs we can do. Now we've got our standard EKG that we know, right? Um, mainly looks at your left ventricle and it kind of makes sense, right? It follows along the left side of the heart. Left ventricle is really that powerhouse. It's the largest tissue area. So it makes sense that in almost all situations, we want to see what's going on there. But sometimes you want to be a little bit more um, widespread in what you're looking at and you want to see what's going on in the right side. So that's when you could potentially do a right-sided EKG. Now your limb leads all stay the same, but your precordial leads, they just flip. Everything about the positioning is the same. It's just a mirror image. So now it's going off of the right side instead of off the left side. And then you also have the potential of doing a posterior EKG. And if you were to do that, again, your first couple of leads, so that V1, V2, V3 would all stay the same, but V4, V5, V6 now get moved to the back and converted to V7, V8, and V9. So you're not going to have extra leads to put on. You just take those last three here and you move them to the back. The really important piece here is that if you do a right-sided or if you do a posterior, that you label it on the printout because there's not really a way to put it into the system. Um, like if you're using our EKG, EKG machine here, or if you're using a free hospital monitor, you can't really go in and say like, this is right-sided. Um, you need to manually write it down. And so what we do is if it's right-sided, you just put a big R next to the leads that have been moved to the right side. And if it's posterior, you would cross out V4, V5, V6, and just cross it out and write V7, V8, and V9. And that way it's very clear to whoever's reading it exactly what it is that you're looking at. We don't do this too terribly often because you can pretty much get most of the information you need from the standard EKG. Every once in a while, you will have somebody that does the, hey, can you do it right side for me and see what it looks like? Our trick used to be, if we thought that there was right side involvement, um, we would actually just move the four from here and literally just put an electrode here and attach it. And if there was elevations, we said there was right side involvement. If there wasn't, then we just moved on. It's, it's not a full right-sided EKG, but at least it gives you something to work with. And then the format of a 12 lead is always the same, right? We have our um, leads one, two, and three in this first column, ABR, AVL, and ABF, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and then lead two runs along the bottom in a continuous strip, which is really nice um, so that you can see what's going on. Some of the machines that I've encountered over the years are different. So sometimes what'll happen is it'll actually, this bottom strip is just kind of a, a readout of what you're seeing um, for each of these kind of like two or three second blurbs and other times it's a full continuation. So just kind of be in mind with your equipment as to what it is that you're looking at. Is it all happening in one continuous motion um, or is each lead being looked at at the exact same time as it's being read? This electric line is something that's important to just understand the basics of it's that invisible line um, in the EKG, short, EKG recording that's showing you where the electrical activity is at rest. And this will come into play a little bit later as we start talking about elevation um, and depression. So you get your printout, super basic. What are you going to look at? First thing to do really is to just figure out what your underlying rhythm, right? Like, is there something there you, you need to immediately do something about before you start getting into the finer details of their elevations, are there abnormalities, things like that. So just a really quick 
are you regular, irregular? Are you too fast, too slow, or normal? Do you have P waves, QRS complexes, normal PR intervals? Kind of all that good stuff. Figure out what is your baseline. And that bottom lead too is really nice for using, um, for accomplishing this stage of it. And then R wave progression is something that's really good to look at when you're doing a 12 wave. So when you start and lead V1, the R wave should be pretty small. And then the R wave becomes larger throughout the precordial leads to the point where the R wave is actually larger than the S wave in V4. So you can see here, we're larger than the S wave down here. And then by the time we get to V6, your S wave is pretty small and your R wave is pretty big. So this would be an example of pretty poor R wave progression. Now, um, if you do have poor R wave progression, there's going to be an absence of the normal increase in that size of the R wave through the precordial leads. There's a couple of different reasons for this happening. If you can remember the acronym LATE, it can help you to remember. So the first one, the L, is left bundle branch block or left ventricular hypertrophy. So those are some things that can make it so that there's poor R wave progression. Um, an anterior MI, whether it be old or new, attention pneumothorax, and EKG lead misplacement. And that's probably the most common one because again, precordial leads aren't always put on the best. Um, but if you do see that there's poor R wave progression throughout, you could think, okay, here's a couple of signs that I can remember late. There's a couple of things that it could potentially be causing this poor R wave progression. And that can clue you in on a couple of different differentials. So axis, I gotta tell you, was not really something that was a part of my normal process, um, but does definitely have a beneficial part. So whenever the direction of an electrical activity is moving towards the lead, you're gonna get a positive deflection in that lead. And if the electrical activity is moving away from the lead, you're gonna get a negative deflection. So what cardiac access does essentially is just give us the idea of the overall direction of electrical activity. So the down and dirty way of doing it is you can look at lead one and lead two and quickly assess those. And by assessing the, those two leads, you can quickly determine if it's a positive or negative deflection of each to determine if the axis deviation is normal, where they would be both positive, where you can see here. Um, if you've got a right axis deviation where lead one is negative and two is positive, left axis one is positive and two is negative, or extreme right axis, both are negative. Now you can see in this chart here, there's a couple of different examples as to what can cause each of these. But why do we ultimately care, right? This was one that I always kind of struggled with and give me a reason why in an acute moment, whether it's pre-hospital or right when somebody shows up in the ED, why I actually care about this. And this isn't just some theoretical cardiology conversation that we have and you know, have later on. Um, but what's really nice is that you can use that in the best situation I can think of to use this in, it's trying to determine a very specific difference. So for example, let's say you have a patient that is in a wide complex tachycardia, but you don't know if it's a VTAC or if it's a sinus TAC with a wide QRS complex, whether it's a bundle branch or some type of vesicular block or something, you just can't tell. You're looking at it and you're like, I don't really know if it's VTAC or not. And you're trying to look at your patient and you know, God knows what they look like, but they have a pulse and you're in this situation where you're thinking, what do I do? Now, for me, my argument was always, if it's too fast and it's bothering them and we need to slow it down, then we're just going to cardio it. We're going to do a thing that we need to do, right? But a lot of people are like, no, I want to know if it's VTAC or not, because then I, mean, I want to know if, if I want to go down that rabbit hole of what the differentials are for causing VTAC, right? So axis deviation can be really nice in that situation because you can look right at your lead one and lead two, and you can see if they're normal or if they're extremely abnormal. So if they're both negative. And Essentially what that happens is in VTAC, it would elicit an extreme right axis deviation. So both being negative because the electrical impulse is no longer flowing from the top part of the heart down, it's going from the bottom up. So it's moving in an opposite direction, causing an opposite response and everything else. Again, that's the one big thing that I can see being beneficial pre hospitally or in a quick situation to use it for. Um, but there are a lot of other examples as to what deviations can be caused from that could help with your differential. So this can be a, a good chart to review. And then we wanna actually assess for ischemia, injury and infarction, right? Like that's the whole point of this is that it's how are we gonna know what's happening and, and where there's injury and issues. So here's a couple of things that you can see. So ischemia, it's gonna occur when there's a lack of oxygenation for the tissues. And that could be that the oxygen demand is just higher than the heart's able to supply. So you're thinking the 350 pound patient that decides he's gonna go out and mow his lawn in 90 degrees, um, or 
you have a blockage that's causing port perfusion. So ischemia can come from a couple of different places. And ischemia is going to shorten the action potential duration of cells, which results in repolarization occurring earlier than normal. And those hypoxic cells might actually repolarize sooner than the non-hypoxic cells. So that makes the wave of repolarization travel in the opposite direction, making a negative deflection for that T wave. So that's why you see that T wave inversion. Now, SD depression is also commonly seen in ischemia, um, and it's caused by dysfunction um, on maintaining the sodium potassium concentration gradients, both intracellularly and extracellularly. And so that is a whole rabbit hole that you can dig down into when you want to talk about that gradient, but essentially there's a, a disconnect between that because of the injury in the tissue. Um, and that's what's causing that depressed look. And a contemporary can evolve into injury and infarction. And then we have the ST elevation. That's kind of like a big one that everybody looks at and talks about, right? And that's generally a sign of more severe myocardial ischemia and injury. And the cells in the tissue in this stage are active dying or have died. And so in S elevation, there's a progression of that dysfunction of the sodium potassium concentration gradient, which is causing that appearance of it being elevated. And then infarction fully occurs when there's death to the tissue from lack of oxygenation. And so pathologic Q waves are going to be seen at that point. And they're the result of absence of electrolyte activity within an area. So your pathologic Q waves are not an early sign of MI. Um, they tend to take hours to days to develop. But once they develop, they rarely go away. So it can be a little difficult if you're doing an EKG on a patient that has a history of MI. So if you see a Q wave, you know, is that from this or is that from a previous one? And when you assess a Q wave, you want to measure the width. And if it's greater than or equal to one small box, then you consider it a pathologic Q wave. Great. So location is important, right? So where the ST inversions, ST depressions, and um, ST elevations occur, that matters. So remember how we talked about earlier the coronary arteries and their locations and talked about the leads and how it was looking at different areas. So now we combine that knowledge and pair it together to figure out what we're seeing on our 12 lead. So when we're attempting to diagnose injury or infarction, we need to see greater than one to two millimeters of ST elevation present in two or more anatomically contiguous leads. So that means that two leads within the same area of the heart. So if you look at this image with the colored boxes, it kind of breaks down each section. So this is looking at the inferior, we've got our anterior area, and then we've got our lateral areas. And so you can see the three main different colors here. So essentially for it to be a STEMI, you need to find at least two positive findings within each colored area, because then those are considered our contiguous leads. And we also want to look for reciprocal changes. So when we have something abnormal happen in the heart, you see it one place, but you usually see a mirror image of it in the opposite side of the heart. And so what we're looking for when we have ST elevation is we're looking for simultaneous ST depression in the opposite leads. So if we were to have, say, an inferior wall MI, so we see ST elevations in leads 2, 3, and AVF, we're going to see reciprocal changes in the opposite areas, which is going to be AVL in lead 1. If we have a lateral or anterior lateral MI, we've got um, ST elevations happening over here, we're going to see reciprocal changes in those inferior leads. So we're talking about the top and the bottom and then the front and then the side. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're always kind of double checking to see that reciprocal side because we, we would expect to see that in a true MI. Um, and we're going to talk about some examples of not MIs in a minute. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're actually looking and making sure that when we see something um, negative that's happening, we're seeing the, the reflection of that in the other area of the heart. So those STEMI mimics, that's what I was just referring to. There are other diseases and diagnoses that can cause abnormalities on the EKG, make it look like a STEMI, even though it's not a STEMI. And this isn't an exhaustive list that I'm going to go through, and it's super basic overview of each one. So if you're interested in any of these topics, I would definitely look into them a little bit more um, because these are really, like I said, just a basic overview. But the first one we're going to talk about is benign early repolarization. So that is usually, it's a benign EKG pattern producing widespread ST elevation, commonly seen in young, healthy adults. And it's actually most commonly seen in pediatrics and especially young black males. And what you'll see is widespread concave ST elevation, which looks kind of like a smiley face, most prominent in leads V2 to V5. So you can see when you look at the smiley face here, it kind of follows that concave and you can see it a little bit on this side. 
you've got that rounding of your ST elevation. And then what you'll also see is notching or slurring at the J point with prominent, slightly asymmetrical T waves. And so that notch J point is called a fish hook in this situation, is often seen best in B4 and is a classic sign of BER. So you can see here, it kind of looks like it's a little bit of a an here. That's that J point where the QRS meets the ST elevation. That looks like a fish hook. So that's really classic for this syndrome. And what you'll also notice is as you go through and you see that there's ST elevation kind of widespread, you're not going to see any reciprocal changes. So as you look here, and you're thinking, okay, I would expect to see some ST depressions then in my inferior leads if my interior lateral leads are elevated. You're not. And so um, that's kind of a clue when you're not seeing that opposite response that you're expecting in a STEMI, that it might not be a STEMI. So if you're not seeing those reciprocal changes, it may not be an MI. Um, and then again, the fish hook is really a classic piece. Pericarditis is one that can definitely get people. So pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardium, secondary to an infection or a localized injury or some kind of a systemic disorder that produces chest pain, dyspnea, and serial EKG changes. And the chest pain is often retrosternal in nature. It's pleuritic and it's positional. So they actually get relief when they sit forward and it's worse when they're lying flat. So if you can use that, if you have that in your assessment, and then you look at this EKG, it can actually help you figure out what's going on a little bit more. But on an EKG with pericarditis, you're going to see widespread concave ST elevations and PR depressions throughout most of the limb leads. So that's um, one, two, three, AVL and AVX. And you'll see it in your precordial leads, usually that V2 to V6. You might see reciprocal ST depression and PR elevation in AVR, um, and then you tend to see sinus tack as the underlying rhythm. So if you look at this example, you can see PR interval depression in V2 and V3, along with this global ST elevation. And then like you can see it in through here, a little bit in through here as well. And then when you look at AVR, you've got ST depression and you've got T wave inversion. So whenever you have this global elevation, um, especially paired with the history and the symptoms, it's usually pericarditis. Hyperkalemia is another challenging one. So hyper-K is a potassium level of greater than 5.2, but usually your EKG changes aren't gonna happen until you hit about above six or seven. Um, and when that happens, you're gonna see peak T waves, you're going to have P wave widening and flattening. Your PR is going to prolong. Your bradyarrhythmias, conduction blocks, QRS widening with very bizarre morphology. And as the hyper K worsens and it gets above about nine, um, you actually start seeing sine waves, BFib, PEA. Um, so you're not going to see ST elevations. And so, you know, you can look at a hyper K EKG and say, well, there's no ST elevations. But you can see looking at this EKG, it is very hard to see what you're seeing. I mean, it's, it's been hard to just break down into what's a P and a QRS and a T wave at this point, um, because it's just so bizarre to look at. Um, and there's a whole another hyper K lecture actually on the YouTube channel that specifically talks about the EKG changes as it elevates. Um, but this can be one that can be really difficult, uh, especially if your patient is maybe unresponsive and can't answer any questions for you, or you can't get a good assessment on um, to be able to diagnose this as, as hyper K versus something else. Bundle branches, which is always everybody's favorite. So in normal cardiac conduction, right, your impulse is gonna travel equally down the left and right bundles. But in a left bundle branch, there's a conduction delay. So the impulse is first traveling down the right bundle branch to the RV and then down the left to the septum. Um, and so that delay causes the widening of the QRS complex and these notched R waves. So your left bundle branch diagnostic criteria includes having a widening QRS complex greater than 120 milliseconds. You've got a dominant S wave in V1, and especially in V1. So always kind of start there as you're going through your precordial leads, because a lot of the information is going to be there. So you're looking at your um, V1 to see if there's a, a dominant S wave. And then sometimes that can result in ST elevation. And your lateral leads might show a tall, broad R wave which it often has an associated ST depression um, and T wave inversion, which you can kind of see here. And then those with deep S waves can have an allowable amount of ST elevation that doesn't indicate ischemia. Yeah, it's, it's, it's what's an allowable amount of uh, ST elevation. 
So if you do have any, even on a, a left bundle, um, if you're not entirely sure, there is Scarboza's criteria, which I always had to reference and actually look at each time because it's a very specific look at this leave and see what the sizes are and what your R wave and your S wave is looking like. Um, so you could use that to try to see through a left bundle. But if you're seeing concordant ST segment changes um, in contiguous leads and you're concerned for ischemia, then I'd just call it a STEMI or call it at least ACS and continue to, um, to treat it that way. And when you think about, so that's left bundle, when you've got a right bundle, typically doesn't give you an ST elevation. And so um, usual STEMI rules apply you have a patient with the right bundle branch, it's just the left bundle branch that can some kinds cause that false elevation, just the way that the, the conduction delay occurs um, that can make it a little bit more challenging to read. Then we have left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is another one of those STEMI mimics. So when your left ventricle is consistently stretched, so you could have aortic stenosis, hypertension, um, it's gonna hypertrophy in response to that pressure overload. And so when that happens, it results in an increased R wave amplitude in the left side of EKG leads. So that's what we're seeing in um, one AVL, V4, V5, and V6. And you're gonna have increased S wave depth in the right side of leads. So your three, um, your AVF, your one, two, and three here. And that thickened LV wall leads to prolonged depolarization and delayed repolarization which leads to the ST and T wave abnormalities that you're usually gonna see in those lateral leads. So in this example, you can see that there's massively increased QRS voltages in the left-sided EKG leads, so right in through here. So much so that these are actually like coming off fully of the page. So when you see that, you see when you're looking at one lead and that S wave drops down into the next lead, um, that's when you should kind of in the back of your mind thinking, could this be ventricular hypertrophy? Um, cause those very deep S waves are, are really indicative of this, but again, it can make it really challenging because you can see that there's elevations here, that the elevations are from a strain pattern. They're not from an MI. Um, Tecosubo's cardiomyopathy, I just kind of put in here because this is a really challenging one, I think for people. So in Tecosubo's cardiomyopathy, it's also known as stress cardiomyopathy. And so there's an acute stress response, which leads to this catecholamine surge, which causes microvascular spasms. Um, and so it actually can morph the shape of the heart. If you have ever seen it on um, like a CT or an ultrasound, it looks kind of like a pot turned on its side. That's how it was named, I guess, is after some type of octopus pot that they have in Japan. Um, but anyways, it, it's really kind of a fascinating disorder. But the thing with it is that you can't actually see a difference between that and an MI on an EKG. So you have a patient that's having chest pain, the shortness of breath, you do an EKG, it can look like a full-blown MI. Um, and there's no EKG criteria to safely differentiate between the two. And so sometimes we'll see providers that'll get into very high level conversations about how they think that it's tubos or they think that it's a STEMI, but um, we really just need to be treating it as a STEMI moving forward until we know otherwise. And a lot of times they're not gonna actually know the answer to it until they have a cath done. Um, so I thought this one was pretty interesting because I had this happen in one of the EDs that I worked in. Um, and the provider was you know, really adamant that it was Takasubos because he had imaging to support it, but we still ended up sending them for a cardiac cath because you just couldn't be 100% until they could see that those vessels were clear. All right, so those are kind of your big overarching STEMI mimics, things that you can see that could look like a STEMI but not be a STEMI. Um, so you mentioned kind of acute coronary syndrome in general. So if you do suspect ACS um, based either on the patient's symptoms, history, or assessment, we do want to make sure that we get an EKG within 10 minutes. And that's 10 minutes from when they enter the building or when you meet them pre-hospitally, it's not 10 minutes after they were triaged or 10 minutes into the ambulance ride to wherever you're going, it's 10 minutes from that first interaction. Um, and that's just gonna help everybody, providers, pre-hospital providers, everyone to identify ACS quickly and rapidly start beginning care because time is tissue. Uh, it's a lot like a stroke, time is tissue. So we wanna make sure we get them to the appropriate place so we can start treatment appropriately. So. There are a couple of different types of coronary, acute coronary syndromes under one big umbrella, right? So we can start with the basics. Stable angina, it's most common form of angina, usually happening after exertional activity. Um, there's a reduction in blood flow within the heart. 
that can lead to complaints of tightness, heaviness, squeezing, chest pain, but it usually resolves with rest and or with medications like nitroglycerin to help relieve pressure in those blood vessels. And that's, and that's kind of your most common one that you, you'll see, um, especially in the winter when you've got people that go out, they haven't been active all year, and then they're going out trying to snubble, shovel out four feet of snow from their typhoid. Um, they can end up having stable angina. They've got chest pain related to that, but it improves at rest. And then by the time they actually see you or come into the hospital, um, their EKG, you can't see anything, right? But then you could also have unstable. Um, so it's a type of acute coronary syndrome in which chest pain is of a new onset, increasing severity or occurring at rest. So versus um, when you have stable angina, it's not occurring at rest, right? It gets better with unstable. It can be occurring when you're rested, not an excursion. Um, and cardiac biomarkers are not elevated. EKG changes such as ST depression, ST elevation or T wave inversion can occur during unstable angina, but they're transient. So it's only gonna be temporary. So unstable angina is kind of like your TIA for your heart. Um, and treatment usually is still gonna include a lot of the same things nitro, heparin, or another type of a blood thinner, um, antihypertensive if the blood pressure is elevated, whatever we can do to try to mitigate those symptoms and improve things. A lot of times you're going to end up going to the tertiary care center, be assessed by a cardiologist, potentially have um, a cardiac cath done just to see if there's any areas of concern um, and, and have further cardiac follow-up. Non-ST elevation MI, so the n -STEMIs. So an n -STEMI occurs when a partial occlusion in the vessel causes injury to the tissues around it. You're typically gonna see ST depression or inverted T waves in two contiguous leads indicating myocardial ischemia, but you're not gonna see ST elevations. Your cardiac biomarkers are eventually gonna be ele elevated, um, but when an EKG is reassessed, there continues to be no ST elevation. And it does have the potential to evolve into a STEMI if it's not treated appropriately, um, but that's typically what you're gonna see elevated biomarkers, but you've got ST depression, ST wave inversions, and we don't have any ST elevations. At a minimum, treatment usually includes aspirin, Plavix, nitro if needed. Um, early PCI is highly recommended in these patients if they have refractory angina, any hemodynamic instability, signs of heart failure, ventricular tachycardia, because that shows instability, um, and elevated cardiac enzymes. You really just want to make sure that there's nothing else that could be going on that we could you could potentially be missing or not seeing on the EKG, or that just hasn't evolved enough on the EKG, but that we could potentially mitigate before it worsens. And then the very common and well talked about uh, ST elevation MI. So it's our most concerning type of acute coronary syndrome. Um, and they're typically associated with coronary artery occlusion and transmural infarction. So that means that the damage has extended through the full thickness of the myocardium or that heart muscle, and that results in myocardial cell death. So when this happens, we're going to see those Q waves that we talked about earlier, unless perfusion is rapidly restored. And typically, once you see those Q waves, they remain. Um, so if you see it, then you're probably not going to get it to go away, even once you do improve your perfusion. And when an EKG reveals a STEMI, a lot of things tend to happen all at once, right? It tends to get pretty hectic. So patients going to need to be transferred to a facility with the ability to do a cardiac cath as soon as possible. If working pre-hospitally and you recognize a STEMI, then you'd want to follow the state guidelines in order to bypass the local hospitals to get to a tertiary care center that has the ability to do a cath, right? Um, all patients who present within 12 hours of symptom onset and have an EKG that's determined to be a STEMI should be considered for reperfusion therapy. And that means a cardiac cath, which is ideally done within 90 minutes of the first medical contact. Now, if that time frame's not possible, so let's say we're in the middle of a horrific snowstorm and we can't get any local service or anybody to come and move this patient. We know we're gonna be outside of the 90 minute window. Um, then fibrinolytic therapy can be preferred for those without contraindications of having that. And typically you see TNK or TPA given for this purpose. Um, again, if you're not able to do transport or a, a bed, I mean, with COVID, we saw a lot of patients not being able to be moved to other facilities, even if there was care that couldn't be done at the smaller hospitals. Um, and so TPA or TNK as a fibrinolytic can be beneficial and helpful um, if they're gonna pass that 90 minute window. And we wanna make sure we're giving aspirin as soon as possible. 
So unless EMS already gave it, it should be one of the first things that we're moving to do. Um, often providers will try sublingual nitrile to see if it has an effect on the patient's pain, perfusion, and blood pressure. And if there is a positive improvement, um, then it's not uncommon to see a nitroglycerin infusion ordered to help to continue to manage that. Um, Plavix or other antiplatelet medications should be administered. If the patient's reporting nausea, definitely attempt to control that nausea before you give the Plavix. Um, what can be really challenging is if you give the patient 600 milligrams of Plavix um, and halfway through the transport, they vomit. And then when they get to the hospital, cardiology doesn't really have any idea of how much Plavix is actually absorbed. So it can be really difficult for them to figure out how much more they could potentially need to give. Um, so if you can try and mitigate that by controlling nausea before you give them anything oral, that would be great because the Plavix, it ends up being, I think last I remember, it was like eight big horse pills. Um, so it's a lot and, and it can definitely make people feel pretty nauseous. So um, trying to get some medication on board for that is great. And then typically you're also gonna see heparin started um, with a bolus and a continuous infusion. And that infusion should continue throughout until they get to the cath lab. Because we're so close to our tertiary care centers, sometimes you'll see, um, especially if we have the air crew come to pick up a patient, fly them up, um, they'll actually stop the heparin at the bedside because their transport time is so short from here to the cath lab um, that the half light of of the heparin, it, it's fine for them to stop it, um, but we should make sure that they have it and that it's available for them to bring um, because sometimes they'll get diverted to go to the cardiac ICU. Um, and so then they can go ahead and restart it in transport. So this pattern I thought was just a really nice overview of what you can expect to see um, during a STEMI. So the initial stages, you're gonna see a hyperacute T wave and then you have some ST elevation. And that's kind of your very beginning. And as the damage worsens, we're gonna start to see a Q wave appear. And we start to see that T wave, as we evolve even more, start to invert. And then our QRS complex looks like it kind of normalizes here and our ST normalizes, but that T wave stays inverted. But then even as we come back to everything normalizing, that Q wave persists where it didn't before. And again, that's something that's really important. And you gotta remember, you can encounter a patient at any stage of this, right? You're not gonna always see them in the acute phase. You might see somebody that's been home. You might have somebody that came in. I've had elderly patients before, they fell at home um, and they ended up having an MI on the floor at home nobody was home and it was several hours before they were found, you know, and they might be more in this phase of things. So we're not always going to see them in the acute phase. So kind of understanding the spectrum of how you would expect it to evolve. Um, and that's another reason why serial 12 leads can be really nice. It can give you a really good indication as to where you are in this progression. So I just wanted to put a couple of EKGs in here at the end. Um, really just to be able to run through to practice some of the reading skills and I'll say everybody reads EKGs differently. So um, like what I used to do is I would always start with my inferior leads and then I looked at my high lateral, my low lateral, and then I would go through uh, my anterior lead. But um, in talking with some other people, a lot of times they start with V1 because you can get a lot of information about different types of bundle branches in V1. And they'll move through all of the precordial leads and then they'll move on to the limb leads. So everybody does it a little differently. The only thing I can recommend is that when you find something that works for you, stick with it so that you're always looking at the same thing every time so that you can pick up patterns. Because the, the first, I don't know, when I first was really starting to get responsible for reading EKGs, I felt like I was always kind of all over the place. And so I would actually miss things because I didn't have a systematic approach. So whatever systematic approach you have, just make sure that you stick with it and it goes through all of the pieces that you want to review. So if we were to look at this one, we can um, kind of start, I like to usually start with the breakdown of what the underlying rhythm is, just to make sure that there's not something else I'm supposed to be doing or treating. And so, you know, it, it <laughs> looks pretty rough in lead two, um, but I can see that I have P waves. Um, I'm fairly regular. My rate is about 90, which I had to calculate off of this because it wasn't really easy to see the six second blocks. Um, but overall, I would just say it's kind of a, a underlying sinus rhythm of some sort, right? We've got, whoop, whoop, scrolling too much. Um, if we were to look at our R wave progressions, that was one of the other things we talked about, right? Um, as we move through, 
Actually, it's pretty nice. We've got a, you know, our smaller R wave moving through and then it kind of picks up here. This one, I guess, doesn't really look as great because you're not having that nice lower S wave. Um, but as you move through it, it's not too terrible in here. Um, we've got normal axis deviation. So if we look at lead one and lead two, they're both positive. So we know we've got normal axis deviation. And we do have ST elevations in quite a few areas, right? So lead two, lead three, AVF. And remember this section is all inferior. So now that we know we've got two or more contiguous leads in one section that are showing positive signs. So we can be pretty confident at saying, okay, I see something pretty massive in this inferior area. All right. We also see that these elevations as we move through in V5 and V6. Again, those are two contiguous leads. Those are both lateral leads. So you've got two more in another group that are positive, right? So now we say, okay, we saw the, all of the elevations. I'm gonna look and see if I can find any reciprocal changes that will support my idea of a stomach. So we can see ST depression in T wave inversion in AVL, right? And that's presumably our reciprocal change from the inferior wall am I. So remember that's the opposite area that we're looking at. But we're also seeing ST depression in T wave inversion in V1, V2, and V3. So that could be a couple of different things. It could be that there's a posterior wall MI, and this is the reciprocal change to that, right? So we could do a posterior EKG, because if there was a, um, an issue, again, since it's mirror image, if there's an issue in the back part of the heart, the anterior part of the heart should reflect some ischemia. And so you would see those ST um, depressions and T wave inversions. But it could also be that it's just anterior ischemia. It could be an actual um, ischemia of that area. And you know, the most common cause of a right-sided MI is a left-sided MI. So um, you could argue this one. I'm sure cardiologists could argue whether or not you need to do a posterior and what this involvement is. But ultimately, you are very confident that with what you found, you can say that you have an inferior lateral wall MI with reciprocal changes. And so in this situation, you would anticipate that the RCA or the left CERC would be involved in this because of your inferior and lateral involvement. And you've got everything that you need to be able to say that you've got a STEMI and activate the, the cath lab or begin transition to a, another facility with, with a cath lab. All right, let's do one more example. Um, in this one, it's a little hard to see, um, but in this one, the rate appears to be about 70. You've got T waves, you've got a narrow QRS complex. Um, in a normal peer interval. So all of that kind of, you know, we're looking good. We've got a pretty decent R wave progression. You know, we're, we're, we're doing pretty good there. Um, there's no axis deviation. We look at lead one and lead two. All right, so then let's start going through and looking at some of our elevations. So you can see that there's elevations here in V2, V3, and V4. We also have some elevations in V1 and AVL. Um, and you can notice that there's actually T wave inversions in our inferior lead here, right? So that means we've got elevations in our anterior and in our high lateral, and we've got some reciprocal changes in our inferior region. So we've got a big old anterior MI. And the vessel involved in anterior MIs is almost always the LAD. All right, so just as an overview, I mean, that was a lot of information and there's certainly, I think, a lot of confusion with 12 leads. I still have a lot of confusion with 12 leads um, because it can just be so patient and situation specific in what you're seeing. And, you know, you can put a couple cardiologists together and they can still not agree on the same EKG. So it can be really difficult. But if your patient history and assessment is supportive of ACS, and you have an EKG that's abnormal, and maybe you can't pinpoint exactly what it is that's abnormal, but you know that it's not normal, that there's something there um, that makes you concerned for ACS, then I would just you know, treat it as ACS until proven otherwise. And you just wanna make sure that you're always kind of keeping other differentials in mind. Um, but if we think if it walks like a stomach and it quacks like a stomach, then you know, we should probably treat it like a stomach.